This is the disclaimer for Wildlife Control Consultant and Pest Geek Podcast with Living the Wildlife Podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing you another podcast of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Hey, glad to have you on board here again. I hope you're doing well. I'm recording here, just uh, I think that we're pretty close to Halloween here, and hoping that your week is going well and that you're looking forward to the holidays as we're approaching here, both Halloween and, of course, Thanksgiving and Christmas. It'll come faster than you think. Hope you had a good year. So just a few things to kind of discuss before we get into the guts of our show today. Take a few moments, subscribe to our podcast. We really appreciate it. Give us some five-star ratings if you happen to like the show. And of course, if you're looking to give us feedback, you can reach me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Would love to hear from you. Love to get some ideas on what you'd like to have me cover. Otherwise, I just cover what I'm interested in and hopefully it'll be interesting to you as well. Well, I've been out in the field uh, training in terms of my day job, and so that's certainly been taking some time out. But uh, uh, today's particular topic, I'm discussing feral cats. You say, Stephen, you've had a few shows on feral cats. Yes, uh, yes, I, I had had at least one, perhaps two previously. Uh, but today's show is kind of special for me because I have been waiting probably 10 plus years to get this last article out, and I'll discuss that more here shortly. So it, we're lo- what you're looking at here is the home page of my particular website. So what we're going to be, I have a publication, of course, as some of you know, on the Practical Guide to the Control of House Cats, but uh, that's not the focus of today's presentation. want to today talk about a publication I was finally able to get out, and so let me have you look here at this page. This is the Wildlife Damage Management Technical Series. Now that's a long phrase there. Let me repeat it again for you. The Wildlife Damage Management Technical Series. This is published by the USDA APHIS, A-P-H-I-S, Wildlife Services. So this is a a page that they have on the USDA website that has publications on various animals on how to control the damage. And so I'm scrolling down here. Let me read some of the names. They have a whole section on birds, and I'll list some of those for you because maybe a little hard for you to see. Uh, American white pelicans, bird dispersal techniques, blackbirds, cedar wax wings, common ravens, double-crested cormorants, European starlings, geese, ducks, coots, grackles, gulls, hawks and owls, herons and egrets, monk parakeets, mute swans, rose-ringed parakeets, sandhill and whooping cranes, vultures, wild turkeys. That's Those are the publications for birds. And then they have a section on mammals where they have beavers, black bears, coyotes, feral swine, Free ranging and feral cats. Well, there's ours. It was just published a few days ago from when I recorded, and I'm recording here in October 2021. So I'm very happy about that. And so, but let me continue on with the list gray wolves and muskrats. And then, of course, they have a section for other, which has information resources for animal control and wildlife damage management, safety, wildlife at airports wildlife carcass disposal, and wildlife translocation. So if you're looking for research-based information on the management of these species and uh, wildlife control-related topics, this is definitely a site for you. And I'm particularly proud because uh, some of you may be familiar with the prevention and control of wildlife damage. This is sort of the double volume three ring binder blue book that some of you may be familiar with and again that's the the prevention and control of wildlife damage and you can see the little blue book there 
you can download this particular publication. It's quite large, a lot of PDFs here. This was basically the Bible of wildlife damage management that was published in 1994. So let me see if I can get you a different, uh, let me kind of maybe zoom in here to show you that picture a little bit better. Some of you may be more familiar with this particular image. That's the blue book here at the right. Maybe I can find you a better one here. Uh, prevention, control of wildlife damage. Let me go down to images. Here we go. This is uh, that's my photo that I took a while back, and it used to it came in a CD version and of course a double volume, uh, three ring binder. It was really the bible of wildlife damage management. Again, it was published in 1994. It was the fourth edition of the book. Now, why do I bring this up? Because I, when I was at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Uh, my boss was telling me about how they were going to be working on the fifth edition. I was quite excited about that. However, uh, it turned out that it just never came to be, despite all the uh, statements saying, yeah, we're going to get on it this year, blah, blah, blah. Well, um, you know, as one of my favorite quotes is, uh, hard work may pay off in the end but procrastination always pays now. And that's basically what happened. It became, uh, it never got done. And so a variety of people who had written articles for the fifth edition ultimately wrote a paper that never was going to see the light of day. And after waiting, I would suspect perhaps 20 years, uh, the funders, uh, took back the money and uh, basically turned it around and said, "We're well, look, we're going to publish this information on our own. And so these are the articles that people had been writing for the fifth edition of the Prevention Control of Wildlife Damage. Since the fifth ed edition never saw the light of day, it never came about, these authors said, well, why don't we just publish it through here? And so USDA Wildlife Services said, we will publish it another way and we'll do it digitally and so this is all available at no additional cost I don't say free because there was some federal funding for some of these articles uh, I don't I can't say that I earned any money from it but perhaps I got some money from uh, the funding for that when I was at the University of Nebraska Lincoln however I was continuing to work with these projects afterwards. Once I learned of this, I petitioned to have some of my articles done because I had a couple written up before I left the University of Nebraska Lincoln and uh, we were able to get these published. What were those articles? I just kind of know this is a little bit of a toot, tooting my horn here that may anger some of you, but I'm, proud of, I'm pretty proud of it. Uh, so I, I worked on one called Safety. So those of you looking for information on safety, for your workers, perhaps for yourself. This is a publication I co-authored with Brenda K. Ostis, who is the Director of Environmental Health and Safety at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. So this is one of our publications on, this is our publication on health, I mean, excuse me, safety and wildlife damage management. And it can give you a good overview of things that you wanna be considering when you are working with wildlife in terms of safety. Uh, the other one I worked on was wildlife carcass disposal. And so let me highlight these. And so I worked with this with uh, Mr. King, uh, who is the main department of environmental protection. And so we published this on carcass disposal, talked about different ways of disposing of carcasses, such as uh, using composting and cremation and burial and the like like that. So we covered all this and you can see the references that we used. And then we also did, I also did another one on, if I can find it here, uh, oh yeah, information resources for animal control and wildlife damage management. And I was the primary author on this and I worked with Dr. Fall and Sergey Lavieri. Those of you in the trapping industry uh, know that, know Sergey, uh, Dr. La, La, La Rivier, out of uh, out of Canada, he uh, helped us make this uh, a Canada and United States publication. So basically, if you're looking to sort of improve your library on 
on wildlife control, this kind of gives you a, a good introduction of some of the best material on wildlife damage management. And then we also drill down, into, we have general topics, the general area of wildlife damage management, like large resources, and then we drill down into specific articles that are of particular importance and value, and also provide links to various resources as well. So we do things on the internet, publications, online stuff. Uh, I think you'll find it quite helpful for you to find resources, many of which are available at no additional cost, uh, and some that you would need to purchase, but you'll be able to see our little abstract to see whether it's worth your while to purchase. So those were three publications that I was involved in. The fourth one was the one on feral cats. And so that was one I wasn't as intimately involved in. I was supposed to be a secondary or tertiary author. I was trying to work with another primary author. And that just never came about. It's very, uh, if, if, uh, if people aren't interested in participating, uh, it's really hard to get them on board. So uh, that kind of fell through. So I kept pushing and pushing and pushing and finally got found some authors who were interested in helping with this and this is our publication that finally came out Alex Ducher and Kyle Pius both of Halix Ecosystems and Restoration they're based out of Hawaii they were the primary authors here Grant Sizemore is of the American Bird Conservancy which clearly of course they're concerned about the impact of feral cats on native bird species in the United States. And of course, I'm the fourth author. So uh, I, I contributed some to this material, mostly uh, I did a few paragraphs and then of course some editing and some content, but I was kind of the driving force to kind of keep organizing, uh, you know, beating the bushes and pushing this forward. But I'm really glad for my the primary authors ahead of me who uh, did the heavy lifting here and getting this document off the ground. So I wanted to just let you know that this is available if you're struggling or you have clients who are dealing with free ranging and feral cats. Notice that phrase, free ranging. A lot of people think that if it's not a feral cat, it's not doing environmental damage, and that's simply not true. Feral cats are those cats that are not owned by anyone. Free-ranging cats are cats that are owned, but the owners uh, abusively to the environment allow their cats to roam free outdoors where they're allowed to just basically kill whatever they want. Let me be blunt here. Cats are an environmental menace uh, on the environment when they're allowed to go free-range or go feral. Plain and so full stop. There is the, you know, we talk about trust the science, which is kind of basically a political maxim nowadays. Where the reality is we don't trust the science unless it agrees with what we already pre previously believe. Uh, but the evidence for this is truly staggering. There are video cameras. People have stories, of course, I'm, of the presence that cats are bringing home. Let, when a cat is outside of the walls of your house or out of confinement, that cat is killing everything it can find. That's how they're wired. They're, they're inveterate hunters. It's what they do. It doesn't make them bad. I like cats. I've owned cats, but they were indoor cats. So what's irritating to me is how we're allowing this invasive species to have run havoc on the environment. And what people don't understand is that free-ranging cats, even if they don't catch the animal they're going after, they're often interfering with the way that animal is getting sustenance. It's sort of like if you were trying to eat some soup and someone, every time you got the, the ladle close to your mouth, someone bumped your elbow. They're like, well, they didn't stop you. They didn't kill you, but they interfered with your eating and made you more vulnerable. It's called harassment. And so these cats also do harm to birds and other native species because of the way they keep harassing them because it's now another predator, another threat that this uh, bird or non-target animal needs to deal with. So if you think they're just killing rodents all the time, that is simply not true. Uh, it's simply not true at all. Uh, they do kill rodents to be sure, but they kill everything. All right, that is my diatribe on cats. So what is this important for you as a business owner and you may be asked by a client to handle cats? So let's go down a few things that you need to keep in mind before you get involved with feral, feral or free range cats. 
Number one, you need to contact or consult the resources within your state or province to determine what, what the legal status of cats are. In many parts of the country, cats are considered domestic animals. And so what that means is, is that they're not regulated by the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks or your wildlife agency in the state. That doesn't mean you can't control them. It does mean that you have to be incredibly careful because you may not be allowed to control them. So that's the first question. The second question is, is what's, what protection status do cats have? In some states, excuse me, like New York, you as a wildlife control operator, you are not allowed to handle cats. Cats are, can only be handled by animal control, which is typically run by a municipality or county agency. So you need to find out if cats are even allowed, that you are allowed to even control them unless you're an, a duly qualified officer as an animal control officer. Some states will say that cats are private property which of course they would be, but if it's a feral cat, how do you how does someone own a feral cat when the definition of a feral cat is that it's not owned? This is where we get into a legal gray area, and that is where the cat isn't officially owned until you trap it and then all of a sudden it's owned. So the rule of thumb is that you need to be careful of is that Typically, when you're dealing with feral cats, no one owns the feral cat if the cat does something bad. However, if you do something to the cat, the cat is then owned and then you're going to have legal damages against you. You say, oh, Stephen, that is, that's absolutely crazy. Yes, there is no rationality in the cat world. It is often there are people in the cat world who are truly, it's a religious, almost to the point of a religious cult where Cats are just basically the sacred cow of the landscape. And so you need to be incredibly careful when you're dealing with cats. So you have to find out if it's legal for you to control cats. That's your first ultimate question. The next question is, is now if it is legal, can you control cats if they are free ranging or do they have to be feral if they are feral how do you confirm that they are feral so when you're talking with your client you need to have your client sign off saying i know for a fact this cat is not owned because if you kill a cat that is owned you've killed someone's private property that's bad so you don't want to be doing that. So you need assurances. So my advice to you is if it's legal for you to control cats and you want to get into this field, you had better make sure you dot every I cross every T. My suggestion is, is that when you capture a cat, that you do not kill the cat yourself, that you bring that cat to animal control or a veterinarian have the cat euthanized there. Some locations will allow you to bring the cat to them. They will hold on to it for a few days. They will maybe check it for a chip. They will look at it to see if it's possibly owned, but then they will euthanize it for you. Now you have to have all those ducks in a row before you even take your first job. If you are in a position to kill the cat yourself, you had better be sure you're using some form of uh, euthanasia that's classified under the AVMA. Not because I necessarily believe in it, you're trying to protect yourself from being sued. And so carbon dioxide may not be permitted for your cats because I believe if memory serves, the AVMA is not a big fan of carbon dioxide for cats because it can make them go into some distress calls and this sort of thing. Uh, it's certainly better than other alternatives, you know, you don't want to be caught drowning a cat per se. Uh, so you'd have to kind of think about how would this look if someone was videotaping me. I know this is very sensitive and very uh, difficult, but I'm just trying to, I'm trying to protect you because if something goes wrong, it's going to go very wrong for you. And the, the cat people 
uh, are incredible. When I when we published an article from the University of Nebraska Lincoln, let me pull that up here for you. Uh, I think this was it here. This was a publication that I was part of at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. This is also available online. Just feral cats and their management. Uh, it's a friend of mine, Aaron Hildreth, that I worked with, and of course, Dr. Hingstrom, who was my, my boss at the time. We put this out, and we had this puppy uh, edited up the wazoo just to make sure we had all of our ducks in a row because we knew it would be controversial. So we published it. Everything was fine. Everything was cool. Like, oh, okay, no big controversy. Six months later, the, the Associated Press came across it and published and note, published it talked about it on one of their on the wire alley cat allies went nuts and so they were basically in a full-on lobby campaign at the university i thought it was awesome myself i didn't care uh because and they were lobbying people i think all the way up to the chancellor and the president and it was amazing they spent a lot of money um doing this they little, i called them little care boxes that had a video and literature about how there was a better way to handle feral cats and whatever their program was. And, uh, and some people can't handle that kind of blowback. Right. And so the question is, I didn't care. I wasn't in, I wasn't in the business. I wasn't losing any money. So I didn't care. I actually liked the attention, but the, but you as a business owner, you may find yourself on local news and people are going to demonize you because you're going to be the great cat killer. And, Again, it's not it's not rational, but people's love of cats, even feral cats, it's not rational. A lot of times, people have replaced the love for children, and they put their love on cats and other pets. So this is part of the immoral inversion of our society at this point. Um, just look at what happened with Fauci, for instance. You know, Fauci. Uh, what was he getting in trouble for? Not not for the research on um, scalping aborted babies, uh, the paying that research. He got in trouble. He got yelled at for having research on using uh, dogs, uh, on letting uh, dogs being eaten on by a sand fly. People weren't upset about what was happening to the aborted babies, but they were all upset about what happened to the dogs. I mean, so you can see our society is really going going crazy right but in any event this is what can happen to you when you're dealing with your feral cats and it's important for you to be aware of don't cut any corners whatsoever always ask yourself if i'm if it's legal i'm not just i'm going to keep repeating that again even if it's legal you better still be sure all your ducks in a row are you are you doing everything above board are you being careful in how you're handling the welfare of those cats? Why? Because when the blowback comes, you need to be able to defend yourself. And it may come. And you need to have discretion and be discreet. But if something does happen and you are being videotaped, will you be ashamed of that videotape? As I tell people, and I'm going to put this as bluntly as I can, even if you are 100% legal, it doesn't mean you're not going to be demonized or even prosecuted. In America, being legal is not enough. You can still be sued and be perfectly legal. Are you prepared for that? So I have done feral cat control under one of the circumstances that I dealt with it. I was actually under the authority of the public health department. Now that's about as secure as you can, as you can get because the health department ordered this company to get rid of the cats on the premises. And I had that in writing, so that was like, woohoo, I got, I got that. There may be situations where you were involved with a health situation and you were, you were being asked to manage cats. Be sure you get everything down in writing and that you know exactly what the law is. Don't just simply rely on someone telling you, yeah, it's legal. You find out where that statute or that regulation or where that ordinance is. Get it in writing. Make sure you have a plan for how you're going to capture those cats, how you're going to care for those cats in the cage. How often are you going to check those traps? Are you making sure that you're covering those traps and so the trapped cat is going to not be suffering from any type of hypothermia or hype, uh, hype, 
hypothermia or hyperthermia, whether it's getting too hot or too cold. Uh, is it going to have that? What kind of protection is it going to have? How are you going to dispatch that animal? Where you're going to where you're going to bring that animal? Are you going to bring it to a vet? Are you going to bring it to animal control? Have all that out planned out before you even take the job. And make sure that client is promising you that he knows or she knows that these cats are not owned. Because if you're trapping cats that are owned, you got to make sure they get back to the owner. Whew. All right, so I've kind of really hammered a lot that down. Okay, so I think I think you got the point there. At least I hope you do. But these publications, let me go back to them again here. So here we have our publication on free-ranging cats. This has just been published. It talks about biology issues, health and safety, nuisance issues, and then it talks about damage identification. How do you know whether cats are causing some of the damage that are being complained about? You know, as I use Johnny Cochran, you don't want to do a Johnny Cochran thing. You want to be sure you're not going a, doing a rush to judgment, as he said. You want to be sure that you're not doing that because sometimes you may see predation, and it wasn't a cat that did it. So you don't want to be trapping something and controlling something where the cat wasn't the guilty party. All right. We don't want to, we don't ever want to do that in wildlife control. We don't just simply trap animals just to simply trap animals. We want to be sure we're capturing quote unquote, the guilty animals, right? To make the, to talk about that. So this publication then goes into management methods. Trapping isn't always the, what you have to do. There are deterrence that you can use there are exclusion devices maybe this person maybe your client just needs to have a cat proof fence and yes they do exist and there's some we have some diagrams here so that there are fences that cats are not able to climb and to get over so those may be an option so there's not there are quote unquote non-lethal or less lethal options for you as well as well as things like habitat modification uh, we talk about shooting, we talk about the role of toxicants, we really don't have toxicants here in the US or Canada, however in Australia they do use toxicants, right? So that may or may not come to the US someday, it's hard to say. We also talk about trapping techniques and best practices and how to use cage traps and techniques to improve your cage trapping and even things like foothold traps and body gripping traps. Here's an example of a body gripping trap box for the for for cats. It reduces non-target captures because again, you're not going to catch a skunk in this because skunks really aren't climbers, right? So this is something a cat can jump up onto, and all of a sudden you can get them into that conibear. Different types of conibear uh, traps that you would be able to use, and then of course we talk about the economics and your and understanding the species in and of itself. So again, a wealth of information followed with a lot of documentation for you as well. Many of these publications are available on Google Scholar if you care to look for them, okay? So again, at no charge, I didn't get paid to write this, so most of this work was done after I even left the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, so I was doing a lot of this on my spare time. But I'm really proud of getting this fourth and final article that I was hoping to get in the Prevention Control of Wildlife Damage 5th edition that never came saw the light of day. Finally able to get this out. So another publication for you, of course, as I already mentioned this, The Feral Cats and Their Management. This is also available online. Again, you can download this at no additional cost. This is your tax dollars at work. You don't have to pay for it again. I don't like calling things free unless they're really free. Remember, the, anything the government does is not free. I, it's strange I even have to say that, but a lot of people believe politicians who tell them something is free, like free college. What a lie is that? Uh, don't believe politicians that lie to you like that. That's just stupid. Um, don't be dumb. Uh, there's a lot of dumb people in America who think that stuff is free. Nothing the government does is free. So it uh, just shows you how bad our educational system has got, where people actually believe this nonsense. Uh, but in any event, this particular publication talks about control methods as well, and you may find some helpful tips in terms of improving your own practice, because when you're doing feral cat control, spe specifically if you're having to trap a number of cats, it's important for you really to do your research and your research. Uh, we're, let's put the legal stuff aside. I've already hammered that home. But let's say you have all the permissions and you have all your ducks in a row, and now you're ready to start control on this particular area. You need to be sure you're assessing that area. You're getting an idea on how many cats do I need to catch. 
because the last thing you want is to use traps and all of a sudden have another cat see another cat caught in a trap and now the cat is becoming conditioned to say I don't need to be in that trap. So you should have enough traps, ideally more than enough traps, to try to catch all the cats at once. Now you, now you say, Stephen, that's not practical. I, I understand that may not be practical but I hope you get the principle involved here. If you're hoping to really reduce this, reduce this problem in a dramatic fashion and properly, you need to make sure you reduce, reduce the problem of uh, trap education or trap shyness. And the way to do that, of course, is often to catch them all at once because some of these cats may have already been captured by cages and they become trap shy. So you need to have find out if they have in the past been trapped because you may not get them in a cage trap very easily again. So you need to be thinking about what your pricing schedule is going to be for that. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong when you're doing your, your cat control in terms of how long this job is going to be because you have to make sure you're telling your client what the likelihood of you removing this colony is. And a lot of that's going to be variable on types of the types of equipment you're allowed to use, how private you're going to be able to be, because even if you're doing everything legally, you may find people on the job where you're working will let cats go because part of the reason the cats are there is that the employees are feeding them. And if you have employees letting cats out of your cages, it's going to be very hard to catch that cat again. So you need to be sure all this is documented with your client and telling your client, look, if people are starting to let my let the cats go, I'm done. And so you may be thinking about trail cameras to catch people and some sort of and talking to that owner about punitive action against employees. Do your due diligence. And these are some publications that can help you in that regard. So as I said before, this was the fourth edition of the Prevention Control of Wildlife Damage Handbook. You can download this. Even though it's getting quite dated at this time, there is still some useful information in it. But understand that the more recent publications here, these would have been part of the fifth edition. They're now being published here. I don't know if there are going to be any more coming down the road. I've finished my fourth one, which was my last publication here. Very glad to have this uh, have this done, but there are I don't know if any other articles are in the works for this particular publication. But this is a think of this as Prevention Control of Wildlife Damage Edition Five, but it's incomplete. But there are a number of species here that may be of helpful for you. And so if you're looking for something where you're not having to pay, I don't want to send Stephen any money. Okay, well, then this is where you'd want to go. If you're looking for a book, uh, looking for a book on cat control that's just going to get drilled down into the guts of control, my practical guide for the control of house cats is certainly available. I think it has, I think it's available also as an ebook. I think you can get it for five dollars as an ebook. This particular publication here, I think, is fifteen dollars. I believe that's postpaid, so you can buy it here from my website. And there, I talk about cat biology, their sign, less lethal control methods, and then lethal control methods. And I talk about euthanasia and carcass disposal. And oh, it's twenty dollars. My mistake. So this is also available for you as well if you wish to buy it. But of course, there are no additional cost resources available and I just told you the one that just came out that I'm quite proud of and that's the free ranging and feral cat publication from let me get down to this particular page here again and I'll read it for you the wildlife damage management technical series let me repeat that again wildlife damage management technical series published by the USDA wildlife services uh, this was basically going to be Prevention Control of Wildlife Damage Edition 5 that never saw the light of day except for these articles. So, all right, covered a lot there. Uh, I wish you the best. I hope if you are going to be controlling cats, uh, God bless you. We are doing God's work and helping to protect the environment and uh, our native species from this invasive predator. If you own a cat, please keep your cat indoors or put it in some sort of a, a restrained area where the cat's not able to ravage the wildlife. Um, and so that'll be healthier for your cat and certainly healthier for the environment and 
uh, we need we have a responsibility to protect the resources that we have in this world and I hope you'll join us in this particular cause if you are going to get into feral cat control or free range cat control research 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 do everything by the book with discretion with full-on professionalism do not cut corners because as I said before even if you are acting in a hundred percent legality you can still get into trouble so be careful about what you're doing and I want to make that abundantly clear I don't want anyone coming to me Stephen you didn't warn me you've been warned uh, it doesn't mean you can't be successful you can but it can but it has lots of pits pitfalls make sure you're charging accordingly and that you're choosing your jobs properly and following the the full spirit and technicality of the law and that you're acting in the most humane and proper manner to protect yourself from from possible blowback all right I'm Stephen Van Tassel wildlife control consultant today we're talking about uh, my latest publication that came out that I'm quite proud of and that's on feral cats this is the Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek podcast. I'm glad to have you join us. Do take a few moments, subscribe to our channel, give us a, a great review. If you have ideas for future shows that you'd like to have me discuss, definitely reach out at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you. And uh, any, I'm going to give a shout out for those who are in Montana. I am we're look we're start trying to start an association of PCOs and WCOs here in the great state of Montana. We have no real organization here, uh, and so we need to kind of get a little more organized. And so I'd like to uh, try to help facilitate that. If you are in Montana, definitely reach out to me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. You've been listening to Living the Wildlife. It's part of the Pest Geek pod Podcast. And why do we say living the wildlife? Because we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care, everyone.